All right. How are you doing today, sir? Very well. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. Well, I appreciate you uh, joining us for this virtual conference and uh, definitely highly recommend appreciate you. Know, I, I always learn a lot from uh, Matt's stuff at Hungry TV and he was actually someone I've had on the podcast a couple times. So I uh, highly recommend he's, he's, he's really spearheaded a lot of the uh, food side and the restaurant tours and retailer side of the programming that we've done for this conference. So uh, I love that he's bringing together the food and tech. And, you know, I think on the tech side, obviously, that's your domain. And something that, uh, you know, I know we first met when you were working on the ride side over at Uber. And, you know, I kind of, you know, uh, put out put out there with the title that uh, obviously Uber Eats, you know, I think uh, is a big part of Uber right now these days. And, you know, I I think I would even argue that they're, um, you know, when you look at, for example, the latest financial numbers they released, um, you know, a lot higher numbers when it comes to gross bookings there are, you know, gross food there than the booking. So, you know, we were really excited to have you on and, you know, someone as someone who's worked on both the rides and eat side, and I think you've actually had the exact same title on both sides. Is that right? Yeah, I was leading the product team for the driver organization on rides as a really excellent experience uh, getting closer to the drivers on the platform. Uh, uh, now, indeed, I lead uh, the product team for Uber Eats. Yeah, so obviously drivers are still an important part of Uber Eats, but now there's even more people, constituents, and stakeholders to keep happy. So I'm sure your job has gotten a little more challenging, but probably just as fun. So I'd love to dive in because I think you're in such a unique position having done this job for rides and eats and kind of overseen this huge transition uh, with the pandemic at the company specifically. So, I mean, just what's what's it been like at Uber from, you know, an employee or, you know, sort of a product lead uh, point of view with the business swinging so wildly from rides, you know, obviously most people knew Uber for rides. And now I think, you know, most of the business is coming from eat. So what's that been like at the company? Well, I mean, I don't think any of us could have really anticipated this. And uh, if anything, I think on Eats, what we're feeling is just a, a tremendous sense of responsibility uh, to step up and, uh, and be available at a time when I think the world really needs it. Uh, and that's actually true for many of the um, customers, if you will, that I looked after before with drivers and delivery people um, needing a, a source of earnings. And it was very fortunate for us that we were able to uh, enable drivers to continue earning by, by delivery. We tried as quickly as possible to reach out to as many drivers as possible. Yeah. For many, they were concerned about safety or things that food delivery changed for them, the changed aspects that um, that really enabled us to kind of continue enabling earnings for them along the way. So that was important. But then also, you can't think about COVID without thinking about the impact that it's had on restaurants and on yeah. our communities. Uh, you know, I can't walk down the street now in my neighborhood without seeing the, the challenging times and how they're affecting um, all merchants, but restaurants uh, in particular. And so it felt like a real sense of um, responsibility and, and need to move fast. And so we moved yeah. very, very quickly right away to try to respond, which came in many forms. It came in the form of trying to enable restaurants to find their customers more easily, to onboard onto the platform quickly. You know, the very first days of COVID after the shelter in place, we had thousands of restaurants that were trying to get onto the platform all at once. Oh. We, we found hundreds of people internally to help add menus to the platform. People who had never added a menu in their lives, uh, but they were doing what they could to get these restaurants onto the platform as quickly as possible. And, and there's been a lot more since then. So we have, uh, for example, a way for um, customers to tip restaurants and yeah. uh, essentially contribute to restaurants. Traditionally, you'd contribute to the delivery person. Uh, so now you could do both. Uh, so a variety of different things like that that were reflective of that. But I think, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, there is now an evolution of thought that's going from, well, how do we respond quickly to the thing that's right in front of us to what does this mean for the world and the next the years ahead, not just the months ahead. And so it's fundamentally affected how we're thinking about our next steps. 
Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think I even remember initially placing an Uber Eats order very, you know, very early on in the pandemic and seeing that option that you could not only tip the courier, but you could leave a little extra for the restaurants. And that was something that I thought was pretty cool. And, you know, I think it seems simple on the future, but I'm sure uh, quite a bit of effort and work goes into developing these product features and changes and really adapting quickly. So I'm curious, in that initial sort of onset of the pandemic, you mentioned that you're onboarding, you know, the, the restaurants and drivers and customers. What what group of the three, you know, I, I would say is was most challenging? Was it most challenging to sign up a bunch of drivers quickly for eats? Or was it most challenging to get the restaurants and food menus? What, what was your experience? Well, for sure, the we were fortunate that if you're a driver on Uber, it's actually a tap of a button in order to right. be able to deliver on eats. So we were very fortunate that that was kind of always there. Yeah, uh, not an anticipation of a pandemic so much as an anticipation of wanting people to earn as flexibly as possible on the platform. And so that yeah. was always an option. Now, way more drivers were choosing it than ever, mm -hmm. which is great. So that I actually, in a strange way, that part went fairly smoothly, hmm. enabling restaurants to orient their their work and their uh, their businesses around delivery was was definitely more of a challenge because it, there's the logistics element of actually adding yourself to the platform, getting your menu digitized, et cetera. But there's also quite a bit more operational work they think about in terms of how to retool their restaurant for delivery, which uh, which I think took, took a moment. And uh, it's been amazing actually to see the resilience and uh, fortitude of restaurants um, doing that and adapting. And, uh, and I think that was, that, that, that was very, very encouraging. Uh, and it's worth pointing out also that it isn't just about restaurants doing delivery. In many cases, this is restaurants that wanted to do pickup instead. Mm. Not every restaurant wants to orient around delivery. So pickup became a very important part of, of Uber Eats. And then another element that started showing up for restaurants is that many small and medium-sized businesses don't have the technology teams or the tooling to go and build up a big web presence. Mm -hmm. And so for customers that are saying, well, the restaurant's closed, how do I get to them? They might be Googling for them, they might be going directly to their website. And so we recently launched a capability that we call online ordering, which enabled restaurants to embed Uber Eats onto their mm -hmm. website, very, very simply. And when they do that, it's just their restaurant they get to control the branding. It's not Uber Eats branded, but we try to do all the hard bits around actually making sure that delivery works, actually enabling the payment method for the customer, mm -hmm. actually doing all those things that are otherwise quite complex to do. So mm -hmm. I'd say the restaurants had the biggest transformations to do and, uh, and, and it's still an evolving process for them. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't seen actually that functionality, or I guess I haven't been on any restaurants websites that have that, but I'm sure we'll, we'll start to see a lot more of those, or I guess the Uber Eats uh, integration directly. But I do think that's interesting and kind of makes a lot of sense there. I mean, what are your thoughts on the on the pickup versus delivery? You mentioned that. I mean, I've seen, I, mean, I think I got a notification from my Uber Eats app the other day about pickup. I see a big, I wouldn't say shift, but it seems like a lot of the app delivery companies are pushing forward and, you know, presenting delivery, or sorry, pick up as an option. I'm curious kind of what the, the benefits are there for Uber Eats, for example. I mean, I think the benefits on the restaurant side are, are a lot clearer. I'm assuming it's cheaper for them, right? Because there's no driver involved. Yeah. For the restaurant, uh, pickup just means that the there's no delivery fee and mm -hmm. uh, because there's no delivery. So, uh, so it simplifies things for that. I think in order to really understand our, our thinking around pickup, and delivery, you actually have to zoom out and think, what is it that we're trying to accomplish in yeah. general here? And really what we see as our value proposition is that we want to provide instant access to local commerce. And every word in that sentence matters a lot because I think local commerce has been so heavily impacted by a transition to e-commerce over the span of years, long before COVID. COVID is just mm -hmm. amplified the, the challenge and the impact, but local commerce has been pretty fundamentally impacted. And what we started asking ourselves is, is there actually a way to turn local into an advantage, into a differentiator? Mm -hmm. And we think there is, and we think that instant access is one of the biggest value props that local merchants have. Now, mm -hmm. beyond that, by the way, one should definitely not overlook the fact that restaurants and all local merchants play a role in your community, play a role in the fabric of what it means to walk down the street, to drive yeah. down. So that's incredibly important. 
that now coupled with the fact that the proximity to customers means that local merchants actually can get you goods much faster than anyone else actually should be an advantage. And that's what we see as the future of Uber Eats. And so then whether that is achieved through pickup, which means mm -hmm. we make it frictionless for the customer to choose what they want and the order is ready as soon as they are ready to pick it up. And maybe for them, that's more convenient. For some cases, you pick up the kids and you go on the way home, you, you pick up what it is you wanted to purchase or whether it's done through delivery, meaning you don't even have to leave the house and it comes to you. That's actually just two different sides of the same coin, which is all in service of providing instant access to local commerce. Got it. So I guess it's sort of the idea that, you know, when I open the Uber Eats app, whether I want to pick up or whether I want delivery, it's all instant and kind of that instant gratification. I mean, that's pretty typical with, you know, I guess food in general, right? When, you, when you're when you ordering food, it's often uh, on-demand nature. Um, and I mean, I guess that, you know, as far as the restaurants, obviously, you know, I think we've seen a lot of talk about the fees that the app uh, delivery companies are charging. I'd be curious to get your perspective um, because I think that, you know, obviously these things have costs, right? It costs money to deliver food and it costs money, um, you know, for Uber uh, to operate the Uber Eats app. So I'm curious, how do you think about the fees that restaurants are being charged and, you know, what's fair? versus not fair and you know i mean even pushing you know i mean maybe restaurants into delivery versus pickup you know i think the pickup option is interesting because the fees are less there for example right well i think the thing to keep in mind is and, and pickup is a notable exception where by the way there are fewer fees as a result we don't charge um we don't charge some of the fees when there's no no delivery required uh but Essentially, the difference between the rides business and the, the delivery and eats business for, for Uber is that there's actually three parties and mm -hmm. there is uh, there's a consumer, but there's two earners on the platform, mm -hmm. the person doing the delivery, the delivery person, and then the restaurant. And so we need to dis design an ecosystem that actually makes all both the delivery people and the restaurants successful. And so the fees are all in service of making that whole ecosystem work now. The reality is it only works if this is helping restaurants be successful, if this is helping the delivery people be successful. So ultimately the North Star is pretty clear and you can tell it when I say things like our goal is to provide instant access to local commerce. But the focus is on actually making local commerce quite successful. So mm -hmm. I think we're all kind of adapting to the situation right now because the way that people are using Uber Eats is now pretty different from the way it was even just seven or eight months ago. Uh, How but, so is that more orders or different types of orders? Way more orders, uh, mm -hmm. way more frequent. Uh, and indeed, uh, the, the orders are changing in shape as well. So the baskets have gotten bigger. And I think that's not surprising. People tend to now order for all the people in their home. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we see more lunchtime ordering than we had seen before. Previously, it was more skewed toward dinner time, but now if you're working from home or otherwise, then uh, then that plays a bigger role. Uh, and then I see, you know, uh, uh, the big transformation that you probably saw right at the beginning of the pandemic, we were sending messaging out to customers saying uh, zero dollar delivery if yeah. you order from local restaurants. And so that actually created way more demand from the local restaurants, the small and medium sized businesses, which was really exciting to see. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, well, yeah. And I mean, I think obviously, you know, from talking to restaurants, obviously one of the, the main benefit to being on an app like Uber Eats, if you're a smaller restaurant is basically the free marketing, the free lead gen, whatever you might want to call it. I think one of the complaints that they've had is obviously the fees, but I guess also, you know, sort of as someone who owns a media business, I understand, right. The, the key to owning, you know, a, a successful media business is you have to own your own customers. Right. And so if you don't um, ever actually own the customers and they're always coming to you through an Uber Eats app, for example, example, or any app for that matter, right? If they were to change, you know, the fees that they charge or the way that they highlight you in the app, that can be very painful. I have seen, you know, that the big brands like Starbucks and Chipotle, it looks like they're able to negotiate deals where, you know, you can now opt in. When I place a Starbucks order on Uber Eats, it says that, you know, you, do you want to share your contact information with Starbucks? I'm curious how you think about that. I, I assume the big brands have a lot of leverage, but how do you think about kind of helping the smaller brands or, you know, the restaurants kind of when it comes to having that connection to their consumers? It's an excellent question, an incredibly important part of what we're doing. So I'll give you a number of examples. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all in service of creating a stronger connection between mm -hmm. the customer and the merchant. 
and the restaurant. Um, so I mentioned already online ordering. That now makes it possible for a customer who wants to deliver your pickup to actually do that directly on the property from that restaurant. Got it. And it's not branded Uber Eats. It's branded the restaurant. We're not trying to... Are they paying the same commission or fees as if they were to, if the order were to come through Uber Eats? No, because we didn't generate that customer. Mm -hmm. for them. Our role is to drive demand to right. those restaurants. So if we didn't do that, then we we don't charge them as if they did that. As Got if it. So, so they get access to customers and to all of these expectations that customers now have around delivery and pickup directly on their website, but we try to do what we can to add value there in a way that might otherwise be difficult. So for example, most customers are Uber users or Uber mm -hmm. Eats users already. So when you get to that restaurant's website, you don't have to log in again. You don't have to mm -hmm. create an account. You don't have to enter your address. Each of those are moments of friction in the funnel yeah. that would hurt a good point. for a restaurant. We're able to make that seamless. You also don't need to enter your credit card or payment information if you are already an Uber user. So these are ways that we can reduce friction. Yeah. Another example is in the interaction during an order, which is actually quite complex. But when a customer is placing an order or when a customer has rated an order afterwards or rated an, uh, uh, an, a particular item, or even if they were contacting support because they had an issue with an order, we're actually opening up a channel where that customer can com communicate directly with the restaurant. Hmm. Customer service is a big part of why restaurants exist in the first place. Yeah. That most of them are very customer obsessed and want to deliver good customer service. So that's something that we've enabled as well. And then the last example that I think is really fun is when you place an order, what you may not realize is that behind the scenes, what we're actually sending to the restaurant is not only the order, but a little indication of whether you're one of their regulars. Hmm. So they will, they will see, and there's a burger place down the street for me that I think is a pretty embarrassing number for me at this point. It's gotta be over a hundred orders that I've placed from them over the years. And we they now have a lot of free credits, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I think I've exceeded my free credits. Thanks <laughs> for at this point. But they, uh, they see when I place an order from them, mm -hmm. the number of orders that I've placed. Hmm. They also, by the way, if you order from them and you've never ordered before, it will say that you're a new customer. Hmm. And so this enables a restaurant to rec do some of the things you would do in the normal world, if you will, yeah. uh, of recognizing your regulars, but also welcoming newcomers. Yeah. And obviously, it's not a perfect analogy yet. We we're early in that journey, but it reflects a little of how we're thinking. Yeah, well, well that I, I actually like all of those examples, but I mean, just specifically to piggyback on, I mean, I, I think it kind of highlights the advantages of technology. Of course, you know, with any technologies, there's positives and negatives, but I think a lot of times people don't necessarily understand what the positives are of, you know, kind of how they can take it, you know, kind of merge the best of the old worlds and the best of the new worlds, right? Like you said, that customer experience, that hands-on uh, nature that restaurants love. I mean, I kind of imagine, you know, for any new customer, just dropping in a little cookie, for example, you know, and just with a little thank you, out um, your return customers when they're someone when you're really busy, you know, prioritizing them over someone who's just, you know, maybe orders once every year or once every three months, right? I mean, those are kind of the tough business choices that business owners have to make. And often they're going in without any data. And it sounds like now you guys are at least trying to uh, enable some of that. That's right. Very cool. Um, and I mean, I think too, on the, on the second example that you mentioned, which uh, remind me, what was the second example? So the ability for the restaurant to actually connect with a customer when there's an issue in an order. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 the customer service area, I guess, is one thing that, you know, I guess from my experience from working with many rideshare drivers, as you know, is that drivers have a lot of issues. <laughs> and so customer service is frankly, you know, I think one of the areas that, uh, you know, Uber and other TNC struggled with over the years, because there's a lot of unique situations and a lot of help that drivers need on the product side for consumer, for Uber. And this is kind of where I want to get your take. I think it's a great product. It's very flawless. You almost never have to reach out to customer support as a customer so you don't have those issues but now in this three-sided marketplace you know customers are probably reaching out i imagine a lot of people are reaching out all three sides of the marketplace are reaching out a lot more because you know if i order my burger and fries from your favorite burger place and they forget ketchup you know i'm pissed at the restaurant i'm pissed at the courier i'm pissed at uber i'm pissed at kind of everyone so how are you you know thinking about like these customer service channels um and like how do you 
plan on handling, right? Like I know Uber drivers love the ability to be able to call Uber when they launch that. And that's sort of where they would get better support than email. And then when they launched in person, that was kind of like the gold standard. So how are you thinking about the, the different uh, constituents and kind of how you can support them when issues, uh, you know, kind of undoubtedly arise? Absolutely. And it's actually a very real problem. The number of things that can go wrong when you have three parties in the mix, we have food preferences, dietary right. restrictions, other things like that in the mix it is much longer. And, and it, it makes for definitely a much more challenging customer service environment. And to the point earlier, sometimes you want that customer service to come from Uber. Sometimes you want it to come from the restaurant. Managing that in an effective way that is seamless for customers is also a challenge. We have a long way to go here. There is definitely mm -hmm. more, I think, that we need to do to make customer service delightful with mm -hmm. Uber. Some of that is getting better at managing that complexity. Some of that is also being more intuitive. And I'll tell you what I mean by being more intuitive. This is going to potentially sound like we're trying to dodge customer service, but trust me, we're actually trying to do quite the opposite here. Mm -hmm. The more that we can automatically detect that an issue is happening and take action on it before you've even flagged it or do it automatically when you flag it, the easier it is for you as a customer, the less cumbersome it is for you to engage with a customer service department. Remember, you're trying to eat. So mm -hmm. a, a specific example of that is a good customer that tells us in the app that there was an issue with an order where there was a missing item can get reimbursed instantly for that mm -hmm. item and they get asked immediately, do you want to order it again? Should we try again? Or do you want to just get your money back? That means there's no need for a customer service interaction. So the more that we can build that kind of technology, the more enjoyable the product becomes to use. Um, but in addition to that, I also think that when customers reach out to us, be it by phone, by email, through the app, whatever it is, uh, we need to, we need to make that experience better and better. And the complexities, they're why we exist. So mm -hmm. we need to work through those complexities. Yeah. And and I think it sort of brings up one of the, the larger, you know, I guess you would say issues that I've had with food delivery at large is I sort of think of it as a game of telephone, right? When you have, normally when you have yourself just ordering food, it's pretty straightforward. But then when you have a courier involved and when you have Uber Eats involved, it sometimes places the orders, right? It's just going through more people and there's more room for issues. And, you know, sort of unlike a ride where, you know, if a driver takes a wrong turn, you might arrive at your destination one or two minutes later, but you still arrive at your destination, right? Um, if there's an error on your food, you it may be unedible, right? And so I think it sounds like, you know, because some of these issues are so complex, just kind of removing them from the equation completely is, you know, sort of more of the, the path that you want to take. And it kind of gets me into more of the larger, um, you know, sort of, I guess, you know, holistic space of delivery. Like I've been uh, a bit bearish on the space just because of some of those instances, you know, in my experience as a cur career and ordering it, like, how do you look at the economics of food delivery with basically, you know, four people involved in every single transaction? Um, is there enough money to go around and, you know, kind of what is that path to profitability? Because obviously the gross, um, you know, bookings for eats is quite high right now, but the profitability is a different story. Well, the, the focus for us right now is to build a use case that is more frequent. I think mm -hmm. the more successful we are at increasing the frequency that which, with which people engage, and also the more successful we are at delivering value to customers through the membership program, Eats Pass and Uber Pass, the more successful that all sides of that ecosystem will be. And indeed, we've seen that happen now. So mm -hmm. the, the goal of instant access to local commerce is actually a broadening out from restaurant and food delivery. By the way, without losing focus on it, we this is our bread and butter, mm -hmm. uh, but recognizing that grocery is an increasingly important use case, uh, pharmacy, uh, uh, flowers, uh, toys, yeah. all, all manner of merchants um, have a role on the platform. And if we can get that right, what happens is the frequency of ordering goes up. Mm -hmm. and what the membership program does is it eliminates the delivery fee out of that. So as a result of increasing frequency, we can then afford to lower some of the costs associated with the overall product that produces a really successful ecosystem for everyone. So that's kind yeah. of the North Star that we have. So it sounds like these other products that you'd be adding, do they need to be higher margin? Because I guess if you know, you're adding more of the same that's not profitable and the frequency is increasing there, it doesn't necessarily get you to profitable. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm curious, like you mentioned, you know, I guess I'm thinking like groceries, alcohol, um, you know, flowers. I don't know exactly what the margins are on all these products, but I assume some of these things that are pre-made or pre-cooked or pre-bottled have higher margins. 
I'm looking at it more as an ecosystem right now. And as a, I guess with my kind of head of product hat on mm -hmm. the goal is to increase that frequency because the goal as a result of that, it becomes kind of a daily use case. Some orders are obviously naturally going to be more valuable than others. Yeah. Sometimes it'll be because of the nature of the goods. Sometimes it'll be because of the size of the basket. Mm -hmm. By the way, one of the other things that will start to happen is that um, your delivery person might be bringing you things from more than one merchant at a time. Mm -hmm. In fact, we actually just announced this last week. So you'll be able to, you can now order from more than one restaurant at a time. Hmm. So it might be that someone else in the household wants one thing and you want another, and you can do that. That delivery person is going to be bringing both orders, which is way more efficient, both for them and for the household. Imagine the next step as we broaden out beyond pure restaurants and food delivery. Mm -hmm. Now that delivery person might be bringing in some groceries, some prepared food, and maybe something from the toy store or whatnot. But not the best scenario, but you get my point. Got it. And, uh, so there's an efficiency that comes from all of that. And so in aggregate, the goal is to create that daily use case. Got it. Do you see that there's more opportunity to increase the frequency kind of directly in, you know, the food delivery and kind of that, those items that you're being delivered or versus, you know, kind of these ancillary grocery delivery toys, whatever else might be, because obviously Uber did, um, or I guess is looking at, you know, corner shop and, you know, kind of getting into grocery delivery. And it sounds like the, you know, trying to merge some of the efficiencies across, you know, different sectors, but, you know, really they're kind of all, maybe not all food delivery, but they're sort of all some sort of last mile uh, delivery that doesn't involve yourself, right? Which I think of as rides. Well, the first thing that we saw with COVID is that I think pre-COVID food delivery was fairly niche. Mm -hmm. And now it's incredibly mainstream. That's a start. Now, the question is, does that all go back post-COVID or not? And I actually think there'll be some kind of correction, but I think the reality is we've now exposed the value of food delivery to way more people. And so I don't think that's going to go away. I think that value is now seen. In addition to that, we see that grocery tends to be a weekly use case for people. So it's mm -hmm. actually quite frequent. In fact, for many people, that's more frequent than food delivery. Yeah. And when you actually then zoom out to include more forms of merchants and retail, then the frequency becomes quite quite a bit bigger. So for sure, I see growth in the food delivery space, but I think adding these other types of verticals and these other merchants is going to just deliver that much more habitual value to yeah. users, which I think will, will help quite a lot. Yeah. And I mean, I think obviously you guys aren't the, the only ones to identify the opportunity in some of these other spaces. There's obviously a lot of competition in the big fields like grocery delivery, but I mean, even others, you know, like the um, uh, sort of, you know, sort of like more niche items, I guess you would say. Um, but I mean, there's, you know, a company that some people have heard of called GoPuff. I think they're valued at a few billion dollars. And, you know, I would kind of consider them as like niche delivery product, you know, I mean, the sort of non-perishable items and not a lot of people think about. So how do you look at the competition? competition and, you know, sort of obviously, you know, uh, Uber is in the middle of acquiring uh, Postmates, but I'm curious to know how you think about kind of the competition, but also the uh, consolidation. Yeah, I think the most important thing is to see what we're doing. That is um, how we see the value of our services when you connect them with each other. Mm -hmm. And so we talked in the context of Uber Eats, we talked about food delivery and Eats Pass membership. Now, when we added grocery to, to Uber Eats, we also then made it so you would get free delivery on your grocery. So mm -hmm. as part of Eats Pass, now Eats Pass became stronger and more valuable as a result because it spanned more than one. The thing to keep in mind is that we also have Uber Pass, which is growing very quickly in the US right, and in several other countries. And so that's actually the first membership program where you now have rides, so transportation, food delivery, grocery. And so you can start seeing the connection across mm -hmm. these services and it just becomes more valuable, delivers more value to customers as a result of doing more things. And so that's the North star that we have. So I think you're right that we're always going to see more players doing individual verticals mm -hmm. and, uh, and that may serve some customers really well. The, the focus we have is on looking much more broadly at convenience in your life, be it transportation, mobility, or, uh, or be it delivery, which started out with food delivery, but will expand quickly beyond that. 
Got it. Makes sense. And obviously food delivery is sort of the, the biggest category right now. So do you have thoughts on sort of, um, you know, I mean, obviously like, I, I guess I am curious, you know, maybe to sort of wrap things up here as far as like, what, what do you see as sort of the benefits of like wrapping up a uh, Postmates, for example, into the Uber Eats platform? If you guys are already right, you said you're differentiating yourselves from other companies and these other verticals by offering everything in one, obviously Postmates and DoorDash and these competitors can't do that in the food delivery space because they're not doing groceries or not doing rides. So what's the strategy kind of behind, you know, like picking up a smaller uh, competitor in the food delivery space? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really speak to the Postmates. Uh, sure. Component, just it's worth a, a shot. <laughs> yeah, it's totally worth a shot. I appreciate it. But I think the thing to just all, almost everything we do can be explained by going back to the, the overall strategy. Mm instant access to local commerce. And our aim is to do that in as many places as possible, by the way, recognizing that rides are available pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we want as much as possible to be able to deliver that portfolio of value across the piece. Yeah. And, uh, and you can see it coming to life, starting with food delivery, turning into grocery, turning into more verticals. In fact, there are places where we're now piloting five or six different verticals at the same time. Mm -hmm in order to see what, what customers value most. Uh, you also will start seeing this manifesting through the product. So a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, we announced quite a few product changes uh, that essentially represent the new Uber Eats. Everything from uh, totally revamped discovery that now spans multiple types of verticals, but also elevates the, the presence of small and medium-sized businesses, makes pickup a truly delightful experience, enables you to order from multiple restaurants. So you're going to see all of those things start manifesting in the product. And it's really exciting to see come together. All of that is now in service of enabling uh, all manner of local commerce. And I think that's the bit that we're most focused on. Very cool. Well, I really appreciate you uh, coming to Curbivore and for our first annual virtual conference. And uh, I'm excited to see what Uber Eats is in store for the future. You know, I usually uh, ask my uh, my guests, you know, sort of where they can find your work. But I think if we want to follow your work, it's really just follow the Uber Eats app, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that'll be uh, what you're up to. And I do appreciate you for coming on. Um, we've got a ne our next, uh, we've got a full afternoon of programming for everyone. So I, I want everyone to stay tuned. We're going to break into workshops now. So if you go uh, as soon as this a main stage is over you can head over to the sessions tab and we've got a bunch of workshops um, a lot of restaurant tours retailers focused stuff uh, profits and platforms in the world of pickup and delivery from get swift uh, so we've got a lot of cool uh, workshops coming up in the afternoon i really appreciate you coming on daniel uh, take pleasure. care everyone and see you in the afternoon sessions thank you